Friends, let us pray. Living God, send us now the help of your Holy Spirit to enable each one of us to receive the word which you speak to us in Jesus our Lord. Amen. I wonder if you've come across the app, What Three Words? It has literally given every single three metre square in the world a unique three-word reference, which means that if you have the app, you can find and share your location to within three metres with every other app user. In a shopping mall or at a festival, on a mountainside or a beach, you wouldn't need to resort to lengthy directions or a complicated set of GPS coordinates to help someone find you. You'd just look up the three-word reference for the three-metre square in which you're located and they type in the reference and then navigate directly to you. It sounds like fun. The three metre square in which my desk sits in my study at Bishopscroft, for example, is Turkey Olive Achieving. And at St Francis Bramley, where I'm due to preach this sermon live at a beacon event on the afternoon of Pentecost Sunday, well, the three metre square, which includes the lectern at which I'm expecting to stand, is Waters Haven Into. All those words are randomly generated and have absolutely no symbolic or logical significance. But of course, people haven't been slow online to search for and to share the most hilarious of those random combinations. So there is a hospital in New York, apparently, where one three metre square has the reference, maybe another day. And a shop premises in Ontario, Canada, has the reference, credit card denied. Just like home is a piece of land on Teesside, and my favourite is Broken Parts Daily, which is apparently a scrapyard in San Antonio, Texas. So, more seriously, what three words come to your mind when you think of the Feast of Pentecost which we're celebrating today? I'm not asking you for random words now, of course, but really meaningful ones, words which help you to get to the heart of what our celebration is about today. I'll give you mine. Spirit. Church mission. You see, there are two connected things I want to do in this sermon. First, I want to home in on some words of Jesus from the next to last chapter of the Gospel of John. The whole passage records the first appearance of the risen Jesus to his closest followers on the evening of the first Easter day, and it includes these words which he spoke to them. As the Father sent me, so I send you. Receive the Holy Spirit. And in homing in on those words, I also want, secondly, to introduce you to an animation which has been put together to help us all to imagine our diocese flourishing and growing, renewed, released and rejuvenated by 2025. It's a five-minute cartoon and it will follow straight on from the end of my sermon and I'm intending to preach for about seven minutes first. My job is to make the link between the words of Jesus and the animation. So here goes. Here are those words. From the Gospel of John again. Jesus said, As the Father sent me, so I send you. Receive the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit is linked by Jesus to the work he is sending out his followers to do. Spirit, church, mission. You know, it's quite common for me to hear someone say, usually quite defensively, that you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. And I accept that in extreme cases they may be right. But usually, when I hear people say that, I'm left with the impression that they are missing the point in two ways. First, church isn't a building. It's not a place you go to, not first and foremost anyway. Church is a community to which you belong. It's a group of people, the family of Jesus' followers, the fellowship of his disciples, sometimes locally, as in this congregation, this parish, this mission area, this deanery or diocese, Sometimes across the country, as in the Church of England or the Methodist Church or the Roman Catholic Church. Sometimes worldwide, as when we talk about the global Church of Jesus Christ. If you are part of Jesus' Church, part of the movement he founded, and if you are serious about following him, you will want to meet with others who love him and who follow him too. If you have received the Spirit of God through Jesus, you'll want to spend time with others who've had the same experience. But people who say you don't have to go to church to be a Christian are usually missing the point, secondly, because they've forgotten that Jesus gave his followers work to do. He entrusted to us the mission that he himself had received from the Father to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God. He has sent us into the world to do the same things his Father sent him in the world, into the world to do, to love and serve God and to love and serve our neighbours and to do that, not least by calling on them to love and serve God too. 
as the Father sent me, so I send you, receive the Holy Spirit. Followers of Jesus are a sent people, and those who say you don't have to go to church to be a Christian have usually forgotten what Christians are sent to do. I'd go as far as to say that there really is no point to church apart from its mission. A 20th century German theologian called Emil Brunner famously said that mission is for the church what burning is for a fire. If a fire stops burning, it's really not a fire anymore. And if the church forgets its mission, if we forget what we have been sent into the world, sent by Jesus to do, we're really not the church anymore. When there is no mission, Brunner said, there is no church. The church exists for mission and by mission, as a fire exists for burning and by burning. The point is that the mission of Jesus isn't over. Jesus is still at work in the world, but now he's mostly at work through his followers, through the likes of you and me, and he does it by the power of his Holy Spirit. Jesus does not give us his Spirit so that we can feel good about ourselves, or even to help us feel close to him and to build us up in our own faith, to help us to believe and trust in him, although the Spirit generally does do that for us. No, Jesus gives us his Holy Spirit to equip us, to empower us for mission so that we can play our part in serving him in the world, so that we can be fruitful for him, both by meeting the needs of the people around us as we seek to love and serve them, and by pointing them to Jesus, helping them to discover Jesus so that they can become part of his family too. Every one of us has a part to play as we put our everyday faith into practice every day, among the people to whom God sends us among family, friends, colleagues, neighbours, others, reflecting Jesus to them, being a light for Christ in the world, to the glory of God the Father. To do that effectively is a tough assignment, but it becomes possible through the power of God's Holy Spirit. Spirit, Church, Mission. I tried typing those three words into the app to see if there might be an actual place somewhere on the planet with the address Spirit Church Mission, but the app told me no address found. The app can offer me, would you believe, Spirit Couch Mission. Friends, even this past year, even in the context of a pandemic, Christians don't do Spirit Couch Mission. We are a sent people, even if we don't leave home, but reach out online. We are a sent people. There is only Spirit Church mission. Jesus said, as the Father sent me, so I send you. Receive the Holy Spirit. So what might Spirit Church mission mean for our diocese in the next five years? Well, here's that, in the, here's that animation to help us imagine it. The Diocese of Sheffield is called to grow a sustainable network of Christ-like, lively and diverse Christian communities in every place which are effective in making disciples and in seeking to transform our society and God's world. This is our vision and we have a strategy to achieve this by 2025. We call this Renewed, Released, Rejuvenated. But exactly what would this look like? Ultimately, we want to see a diocese that is vibrant and flourishing with supported and newly energised clergy and where all people harness their gifts, releasing them to share the good news of Jesus with others in our communities and making a real difference in the process. We will see a different approach to the model of ministry with every deanery containing a number of mission areas. These will be formed from an existing single parish or by partnering two or more parishes together. Each mission area will have at least one ordained oversight minister, usually but not always stipendary, who will have different gifts and areas of responsibility. They will form a mission area leadership team which will include self-supporting ministers and focal ministers. A focal minister can be lay or ordained, supporting the life of the church in all its fullness. It's worship and prayer, mission and community engagement, witness and evangelism, pastoral care and teaching, nurture and discipleship. With this thriving team in place, what will it look like across the mission area? 
Cedric is a lay reader and together with his wife Betty they have been leading monthly services for 40 years. They have felt a fresh buzz building in the last 18 months and they are thrilled that the Sunday service is alive with new families. Junior Church has restarted as a result and there are talks about a second congregation in the afternoon to help with space issues. Betty is praising God that the church she loves no longer seems to be in decline. She now feels so much hope for the future. In the church hall on Monday, focal minister Ant has been leading a small group on a Lights for Christ course. Sue's confidence has grown and working through the week in an office she began to tell others of her faith. A colleague going through a difficult time due to her mum's health asked Sue to pray with her. Word spread in the department and now Sue holds a small prayer gathering in the office every Monday lunchtime. Sam works in a bar in town and is a worship leader who has recently become a church warden. Combining these skills, Sam has started an explorers group that meets in the bar on a Tuesday lunchtime. Sam loves being part of this group and the wider diocesan learning community, making the most of the online and face-to-face -face training and building new friendships and valuable connections along the way. Reverend Jill is the oversight minister for this mission area. She's been running a small school-based service on the first Wednesday of every month. The children loved it from the start, and while it has taken a few sessions, some of the families have started to attend the all-age service on a Sunday morning in the church building. Dion is a youth worker with the Centenary Project. He has five young people that regularly attend and get involved with a youth-led service that has been running for the last six months on a Thursday evening. Dion noticed that one member seemed to show natural leadership abilities. He told the group about the youth leader internship and that one young person has shown a keen interest in taking it further. When he tells Reverend Jill she is delighted and encourages him to take it further. Linda and Paul are lifelong members of their church, both worked in a local care facility for 30 years. They've always felt a pastoral calling to the older generation, especially the isolated. With the support of the diocesan NATA network, they've been growing a Friday coffee morning. Following their experience of the coronavirus pandemic, they felt called to develop their skills further. They are now focal ministers pastorally supporting the older members of their local community and running a monthly service for them. As Jill looks across the activities of her mission area, her heart fills with joy as she sees a supportive network that nurtures and nourishes different congregations in a variety of settings. Vocations and callings are recognised and encouraged, and people are generous in giving in their gifts. Jill feels supported in this by a centrally managed resource that looks to deploy staff where needed and offer expertise, advice, training and support. The result is that in each part of the mission area the church is embedded in the community and serving its people. Pubs, gyms, community centres, cafes, charity shops, food banks, offices, schools, colleges, prisons, hospitals, homeless shelters, and on and on. And we see these thriving, lively, and diverse church communities across the diocese, supporting each other in transforming society and building the kingdom of God.